Jesus teaches his disciples to say no, to say no to sin and to the desires of our old nature, our flesh. And this is a teaching for radical disciples in the very last days who want to obey the Lord, just like his early disciples in the same way. We follow the Lord. We want to obey him in every way. If you'd like to have the video playlist of each and every session and also the accompanying PowerPoint presentation slides, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Elijah003 at gmail. We're going to focus on this passage from Luke 17, verse 1. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would, be a, it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. And by little ones, Jesus is talking about you and me. He doesn't want us to stumble. Verse 3, so watch yourselves. Jesus commands us to watch ourselves. And then he goes on to say, if your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Not so easy to do. So look how the apostles responded. Verse 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Jesus replied, verse 6, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Verse 7, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, you prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. That's how we treat our servant. Verse nine, will he thank the servant because he simply did what he was told to do? Verse 10, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We're going to study this passage from Luke chapter 17. After we repent, and we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we disciples, we become his servants. We become servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of the age, as his servants, we will stand before our master. There will be an accounting for what we have done or for what we have not done in obedience to his commands. At that time, the Lord will be giving us eternal rewards. And that consists in part of authority to reign with him in his eternal kingdom. And that is for faithful and fruitful disciples. Now, New Testament scripture teaches that some servants will be judged to be a wicked servant by the Lord. Some servants will be called wicked. Now, it would certainly behoove us to look into this matter. So who are they? Who are these wicked servants? And what will happen to these wicked servants? Let's have a look. In the parables of the kingdom of heaven taught in Matthew's gospel, the term wicked is applied on three different occasions to refer to some of the master's servants. On the first occasion, it was applied to the servant who refused to forgive his fellow servant. Let's look 
at that parable. This is in Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, verse 23, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, as he began the settlement, as this nobleman began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, that's a lot of money, 10,000 bags of gold. Verse 25, since the servant was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. Verse 26, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him, before his master. And he said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Verse 27, the master's, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Verse 28, but when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. Now, of course, 100 silver coins is nothing compared to 10,000 bags of gold. Nothing. That servant grabbed his fellow servant and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant, verse 29, fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Verse 30, but the servant refused. Instead, he went off. He had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Verse 31, when the other servant saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Verse 34, in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed, 10,000 bags of gold. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Now, our Lord and Master commands us to forgive our brother or sister from our heart, not just with our mouth, but from our heart. If we disobey his command, we will be turned over to the jailers to be tortured until we pay back to the Lord what we owe him. And what do we owe the Lord? Well, we owe the Lord a debt, a debt which consists of all of the sins we have committed during our life. And of course, that is impossible for us. It's impossible. And so this servant was going to be tortured. He was going to be tortured. Now, whatever being tortured by the jailers actually entails, we do not know for sure, all right? And of course, we would prefer not to find out for ourselves what it means to be tortured by the jailers. It might refer to physical sickness for a servant, meaning for a believer. It might refer to physical sickness. 
among other tortures, all right? And so that is why when we are ministering to sick believers, we make sure that they have forgiven other people who have sinned against them, who have hurt them in some way. Forgiveness is very important for a believer, a born-again believer, to be healed by the Lord. If you do not forgive, you will be tortured by the jailers. Now, whatever the case, whatever torture, being tortured by the jailers actually means, well, forgiving others is not optional for a servant of God. It's not optional for us disciples of Jesus Christ. No, we are commanded to forgive. So, how is it possible for us to forgive someone 70 times as Jesus commanded? How do we say no to unforgiveness and bitterness in our heart? How? Or how does a man say no to the temptation to pornography and fantasy lust? How do we say no to that type of temptation? How do we say no to losing our temper and getting angry all the time? How do we say no to that which tempts our flesh to sin? Let's see. Mark eleven twenty three. Jesus taught, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now, so how do we move, quote unquote, mountains in our lives into the sea? In our lives, there could be various mountains, which we want to remove. We want to remove them into the sea. So, According to Matthew eleven twenty three 23 above, how do we move those mountains into the sea? Well, we're going to skip one verse to verse 25 of the same chapter, Mark 11, and we're going to uncover the condition for moving a mountain in our lives into the sea. Mark eleven twenty five, Jesus said, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Hmm. If we want our Father in heaven, and we're talking about a born-again believer, if we want our Father in heaven to forgive us of our sins, we must forgive that person against whom we have something because they hurt us. That is a condition for a born-again believer to receive the forgiveness of sins. And so, if we want to move a mountain in our lives into the sea, we must first forgive others. Again, in our lives, we have various mountains that we would rather do without. We would rather move them into the sea. But a prior condition for moving that mountain into the sea is forgiving others. That's a precondition. Let's find out how to forgive those who have hurt us. Let's now go back to Luke 17, which I read at the very beginning of this hour. Let's focus back on that chapter. There... Jesus taught his disciples about things that cause people to sin. Let's look again, once again, at Luke 17, verse 1. Let's repeat it. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come. Yes, that's right. But woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. That's verse three. Jesus says, watch yourselves. 
We need to watch ourselves in order to stay away from things that cause people, meaning that cause us to sin. We have to watch ourselves. We want to stay away from things that will cause us to sin. Now, what sin is Jesus referring to here? And in fact, he is referring to a particular sin. So let's keep reading Luke 17 to find out exactly what sin Jesus is referring to here. Luke 17, 3b, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. So, Jesus here, in verse 17, verses 3 and 4, he is focusing on the sin of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness in our heart. Let me jump to Matthew 18, verse 21, and then later we will come back to Luke 17. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, such a scenario, of course, is not going to happen. I don't think you're going to have a relationship with someone who is going to sin against you 77 times in a single day. Even in a marriage relationship, that is not going to happen. All right? But I believe Jesus is making a point here. No matter how many times that person has sinned against you, you must forgive them up to 77 times. Now, Jesus here, he is commanding us to do something which is against our human nature. It's against our human nature to forgive someone who has hurt us. If someone hurts us even once, it is not easy to forgive that person from our heart even if he or she repents and asks us for forgiveness. We like to remember what that person did. And we like to nurse a grudge against that person. That's our human nature. Given that human nature, it is therefore virtually impossible to forgive that brother or sister seven times in a single day, given our fallen nature not to mention 77 times. Given our human nature, that is, our flesh, our flesh, this is a mountain that is simply too huge to move. I'm talking about the mountain of unforgiveness due to our flesh. Now, 2,000 years ago, the apostles realized this when Jesus was teaching them from Luke 17. They realized that that mountain is too big for them to move. And so they asked Jesus for more faith, for more faith in order to move the mountain of our flesh, which renders us unable to forgive others, into the sea. Luke 17. Verse 3, repeating verse 3, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And immediately, in the very next verse, the apostles asked Jesus to increase our faith. Verse 5, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith, Lord, increase our faith, because it's impossible for us to forgive someone seven times in a single day. That is a mountain that is too big for us to move. We need more faith. We need more mountain-moving faith to move that mountain of unforgiveness into the sea. 
Verse 6, Jesus replied, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. <clears throat> now, in response to the disciples' plea for more faith, Jesus spoke of commanding a mulberry tree to be uprooted and planted in the sea. Jesus is not talking about prayer here. He's talking about us directly speaking to a mulberry tree, commanding it to be uprooted and planted in the sea. Now, I heard from a scientist friend of mine that it is against the very nature of a mulberry tree, which lives only in fresh water, to be replanted in the sea, which consists of salt water. So it is physically impossible to move a mulberry tree from the ground into the sea, all right? Physically impossible in several different ways, of course. But Jesus taught. He taught the disciples that it could, in fact, be done if one had faith as a mustard seed. Now, elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus taught his disciples about this kind of faith. Faith as a mustard seed, of course, is equivalent to mountain-moving faith. We have already studied mountain moving faith in the Elijah Challenge training. Let's do a brief review of mountain moving faith according to the Elijah Challenge training. A brief review. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, verse 15, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. Verse 16, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Verse 17, you unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy. And he was healed at that moment. Verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and they asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, therefore, faith as a mustard seed is equivalent to mountain moving faith. Jesus taught his disciples if they have faith as a mustard seed, they can speak to a mountain and command the mountain to move, and the mountain will obey, and nothing would be impossible for them. Faith as a mustard seed is equivalent to mountain-moving faith. Now, let's repeat Luke 17. Once again, let's go back there. Luke 17, verse 3b. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Verse 4. If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith so that we can forgive. Verse 6, he replied, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Therefore, the faith to command and move a mulberry tree into the sea is the same as the faith required to command and to move a mountain into the sea. It's the same kind of faith. And for those who have gone through the Elijah Challenge training, 
Jesus is essentially teaching here the same faith which is needed to heal the sick or drive out demons. That is mountain moving faith. In the Elijah Challenge training, we have made it clear that when you heal the sick or cast out demons, when you issue commands to infirmities and demons, you issue the commands with mountain moving faith. And that is the same kind of faith which is required to move a mulberry tree into the sea. Faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith. And with mountain moving faith, we are able to forgive others. Huh. With faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith, not only can we heal the sick and cast out demons, we are also able to forgive others, even if they sin against us seven times in a single day. The very same kind of faith with which you heal the sick and cast out demons, that is the very same faith by which you forgive others when they sin against you. Now, when we give a command to something under our authority with mountain moving faith, we have no doubt that it will obey us. That is how we command our pet dog to sit. If I have a pet dog and I want him to sit, I say sit with mountain moving faith. I know I can make my dog sit. He is under my authority. No question I can make him sit. Even if he does not want to sit, I can force him to sit by pressing down on his back until he sits. That is authority. Likewise, when we command infirmities and demons to go with mountain moving faith, we have no doubt they will obey us. Why? Because they are under our authority. Luke 9 verse 1. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them supernatural power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Therefore, demons and diseases are under our authority, especially when we are proclaiming the kingdom of God. Jesus gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. That means when we are proclaiming the kingdom of God, diseases and demons are under our authority. Now, that is clear for those of you who have come to the Elijah Challenge training. But what else is under our authority? There is a third thing which is under our authority. Servants are under our authority. By definition, a servant is under our authority. Now, our flesh is our servant. Our flesh is our old nature. That is our servant. It is under our authority. Like a servant, our flesh, our old nature is under our authority. And then Jesus goes on to teach us about the relationship between a master and his servant. Let's return once again to Luke 17, where the disciples asked Jesus to, quote, increase our faith, unquote, so that they could forgive their brother or sister seven times in a single day. Let's go back there again. Luke 17, verse 6, Jesus replied, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Verse 7, Jesus said, suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, oh, come along now and sit down to eat? Of course not. Let's say 2,000 years ago, you were a master, you were a wealthy landowner, and you had servants. And one of your servants, early in the morning, he was sent out to the field to look after your sheep, 
or to do some plowing, to sow some seeds. And around lunchtime, your servant comes back to the house. He is somewhat tired. He knocks on the door, knock, 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 and you go and open the door, and there you see your servant standing there. Would you say to your servant, oh, you poor thing, you, you must be so tired, you must be so hungry, oh, you poor thing, come in, come in, come inside, sit down at the table, I will go into the kitchen and prepare some food for you. Would you do that for your servant? Of course not. Verse 8, would he not rather say to the servant, hey, you, prepare my supper. Get yourself ready. You wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Would the master rather, would he rather not say that? And the answer is, of course. That's how you treat your servant. Even if your servant comes home, he's tired, he's hungry. No, your servant will go into the kitchen and prepare a meal for you. You sit down and eat what he has prepared for you, and he will wait upon you. And after you finish, then your servant comes and he can eat the leftovers. That's how it works, especially in Asia. Luke 17, verse 9. Would the master thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? Would the master go to the servant and say, oh, you're such a good servant. I can't believe you actually obey my orders. You actually spent the whole morning outside in the field looking after my sheep, plowing the soil. Oh, I can't believe that you are so faithful. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I will promote you. Oh, I will reward you because you obeyed me. You did what I told you to do. Will that happen? Of course not. The servant is simply doing what a servant is supposed to do, which is what? Which is what? Which is obeying the master's command. So, masters, of course, do not spoil or coddle their servants in that way. No, no, no. That is not a master exerts authority over a servant. Eventually, a spoiled or coddled servant will begin to disobey the master's orders and even rule over his master. How do we exert our authority over our servant? We expect our servant to obey immediately. And if they do not, we get angry. We get ticked off. We force our servant to obey us. Let me give you an illustration. This is from a formerly very famous movie star about taking authority over her pet monkey. We happen to know a... Uh, a woman who was very famous in America about 60 years ago. She was a movie star. Uh, she starred in the Ten Commandments along with Charlton Heston. Okay, very famous. Uh, not only that, uh, she was the very first love interest of Elvis Presley. Uh, Elvis actually wanted to marry her, but her mother would not allow it because at that time she was still quite young. And she told us that when she was young, when she was a famous movie star, she had various pets in her home. And one of them was a monkey, a pet monkey. Turns out that monkeys, they are intelligent. They have the intelligence of a two or three year old human. And she told us that she would have to teach her pet monkey to obey her commands. Otherwise he would be very naughty and very mischievous. So whenever, she told him to do something, she would force him to obey. She would not allow him to disobey even once. If he disobeyed even once, if she allowed the monkey to get away with even a single act of disobedience, afterwards, the monkey would no longer obey her commands. 
she insisted that the monkey obeyed every command. If she let him get away with a single act of disobedience, then he would be out of control. All right? This is how you exert authority over something under your authority. In the same way, scripture teaches that we have authority over our flesh. Authority over our flesh, our old nature, our sinful nature. It's under our authority. It has been crucified with Jesus on the cross. But if we give in to it, even once, we will have problems controlling it later on. Just like our sister, the famous movie star with her monkey. She would not allow it to disobey her even once. And, in, and so in the same way, we should not give in to our old nature even once. Because later, we will have problems controlling it. We must rather treat our old nature like our movie star treated her pet monkey. Extremely strictly. Our movie star friend, by the way, she is a born-again, spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 8.13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die, meaning it will control you eventually, and you will sin. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Apostle Paul here teaches that we have authority to put to death our sinful nature by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Thus, when our sinful nature tempts us to sin, we do not coddle it by entertaining its suggestions. No, we do not. But rather, we treat it harshly as a master would treat a servant. Exactly as you would treat a demon or a disease. That's how you treat your old nature. That's how you rebuke your old nature. Exactly as you rebuke a demon or a disease. Let me give you an illustration for sisters. Okay? Let's say you and your husband, you have served in your church for many years. And so... The pastor is very pleased with you, and the pastor has appointed your husband to be an elder in the church, okay? And you yourself, as a sister, you have been very faithful and fruitful leading a cell group in the church, and now, because the pastor knows that you are extremely trustworthy, the pastor has elevated you to be treasurer of the church, so you handle the finances of the church. Very important position. And it happens that because your husband is such a, a hard worker and so trustworthy, he has been given a big promotion in the company where he works, okay? He's been given a considerable raise. And your 40th wedding anniversary is coming up, and your husband wants to bless you, so he has gone out and purchased a new car for you. The car you have been driving is 15 years old. He wants to bless you on the occasion of your 40th anniversary with a new car. And so because he has been given a considerable raise by his boss, he went out, bought a new car for you, a surprise gift for your 40th anniversary. Okay. But it turns out that when you were leading a cell group, you had a new believer there, another sister, a brand new believer. And you came to know her, you built a relationship with her, and you began to disciple her. So she came to know you, but she is an immature new believer. And uh, this new sister, she doesn't have to work. She stays at home, okay? So she has some time at, on, uh, at her disposal. She doesn't have any children yet. So uh, sometimes she spends her time on the phone, just talking with other people in the church. And one day, while she is talking to another sister, she suddenly remembers that you have a brand new car. And then a thought occurs to her. Wow, 
how could they afford a brand new car? That is really strange. It's interesting. Oh, she's the treasurer of the church. Oh, no, it couldn't be. Maybe she is stealing money from the church in order to buy that new car. Oh, wow. It's a total lie. It's slander, of course. But you know what she does? Because she is a brand new immature believer, she begins to share her thinking with other sisters in the church. That maybe you stole money from the church to buy that new car. And so one day, uh, a sister who knows you hears this slander. And that sister calls you up on the phone. And that sister shares with you the gospel, the slander that she has heard about you, that you stole money from the church. And when you hear this slander, your servant comes back from the field and knocks on your door. Knock, 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 knock. And there is your servant standing before you. And your servant says, did you hear what this woman said about you? You better be angry. Oh, you better be so angry and bitter. You better go see her right now. Go to her home. Open the door. When you see her, slap her in the face. Kick her out of the church, out of your cell group. Oh, never forgive her. This slander is terrible. It is a total lie. You are so hurt. You are so hurt. You are so hurt. You must be angry at her and never forgive her. Okay? That's your servant standing at your door. What do you say to your servant? Do you say, oh, what a good servant you are. Come in, sit down. I will go to the kitchen, prepare some food for you and serve you. I'll sit down and eat with you. And tell me more about this wicked woman. If that is how you treat your servant, what's going to happen to you? Yes, you will fall into the sin of bitterness and unforgiveness. And as a result, if you get sick, the Lord might not heal you because you are now paying the price for unforgiveness. You have been handed over to the torturers to torture you until you pay off your debt. Okay. Let me give you now an illustration for brothers who may be listening. Brothers and sisters, we are, we are very different. I have found being married to my wife for 48 years that women are generally more sensitive, especially to things that they hear. Uh, men are different. Men are like ducks. If we hear criticism, it just bounces, us, bounces off of us like water off of a duck, right? But uh, what is a typical weakness for a brother in Christ? Well, typically, pornography and fantasy lust, something I mentioned at our last class. Okay? The problem that many men have, including some pastors and believers, the problem could be pornography and fantasy lust. We can overcome this temptation, of course, by exercising authority over our flesh, which is our servant. Okay, That's how you deal with your old nature. It is your servant, and you say, no, I rebuke you. Okay, Now, let's say in the past, you struggled in this area of pornography and fantasy lust, but you have overcome it because now... You're a believer, you're born again, you go to church, and you, are, you have been released, set free from this problem with pornography and fantasy lust. But one day you are checking your email, and you receive something from a familiar email address, and you're curious, and so you open the email, but it turns out to be dangerous spam. Why is it dangerous? Because suddenly you find yourself stunned by pornographic images they explode before your eyes seemingly irresistible images jump out from you from your screen yes you're familiar with those things from your past but now in the present they're jumping out at you 
your servant, your sinful nature, picks that very moment to knock on your door. Knock, 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 knock. You go to your door, you open it, and there stands your servant. What does your servant say to you? Wow, oh, you haven't seen that in a long time, have you? Whoa, but hey, it's okay, it's okay, it's all right. This, won't, this one look is not going to hurt you. It's all right. Oh, just look at her. Whoa, your wife doesn't look like that anymore. Whoa, just stay for a moment. It's okay, don't worry about it. Come on, you're a man, aren't you? Your servant, your flesh, then reminds you, hey, don't forget, the Lord is merciful. He will forgive you. If you just confess it to him later, remember, Jesus died on the cross to bear your sins. All you got to do is 1 John 1, 9. If you just confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Remember 1 John 1, 9. So you don't have to stop now. It's okay. It's okay. Hey, why don't you click on that very sexy link down over there in the corner? Now, of course, we should not have allowed our servant to get even that far, all right? But, and of course, we should not have given our flesh, our servant, an opportunity to speak to us in that way, all right? But if it does, what should we say to it? If our servant is knocking at our door, knock, 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 knock. Oh, look at that woman there. You haven't seen that in such a long time. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Jesus will forgive you. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Knock, 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 knock. What should we say to our servant? We must know what to do and what to say to our servant when he knocks on our door. What do we say? No, I rebuke you. Go away. That's how you exercise authority over your servant, over your flesh. No, I rebuke you. Leave. You rebuke it, just as you would rebuke a demon or a disease. But on the other hand, if we invite our servant, oh, come in, come in. What a good servant you are. Come in, sit down. I will go into the kitchen and prepare some food for you, and then I will come out and serve you, and I will sit down. Show me more. <laughs> Show me more. If you do that, if you serve him food and eat with him, we will be in trouble. Yes, we will fall into the sin of fantasy and lust and pornography again. Now, yes, if we are truly repentant afterwards, and we ask the Lord to forgive us. Yes, indeed, he will forgive us. But there will be a price to pay for failing to be strict with our flesh. There will be a price to pay. A price to pay for failing to exercise strict authority over our flesh. Among other things, we could be harassed by images. We may once again need deliverance from the spirit of pornography. And this time, it might be more difficult to be set free. What is the consequence when we allow, for example, an evil spirit to return? Let's say when you were younger, you had a spirit of pornography, fantasy lust in you. And you had to undergo deliverance to have it driven out so that you were no longer, no longer obsessed with pornography and fantasy lust. You went, underwent deliverance. But now, in the moment of weakness, when you allow your servant to, <laughs> to coax you, to tempt you to sin, now you need deliverance again because they have come back. But look what Jesus said in Luke 11, verse 24. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, 
it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. When that spirit of fantasy lust comes out of you, it goes through arid places seeking rest, but does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. So now, yeah, you have been set free from that spirit of pornography that you had before. You're, you have been swept clean and put in order. Now you're going to church every Sunday. But because you allow that thing to come back, you allow your servant to tempt you. Now, look what happens. Verse 26. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and they live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So if you are a brother and at one time you had a demon, an unclean spirit of fantasy lust due to pornography and you have been set free, you have been delivered, do not allow it to come back. Do not allow your flesh. Do not allow your flesh to tempt you to look at pornography again. And because if you do, that spirit could come back bringing seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And then your final condition could be worse than your first. So Luke 11.26 tells us that when the unclean spirit returns, he brings with him seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And our final condition will be worse than the first. Could this also apply if we allow our flesh to return? If we allow our old nature to command us to take authority over us so that we end up sinning? Could this also apply? And I believe the answer could be yes. Therefore, instead of coddling our sinful nature when it tempts us to sin, we should immediately rebuke it severely, commanding it authoritatively with mountain-moving faith or mulberry tree-moving faith to be quiet, to shut up, and to go. We chase our servant back to the fields. When he comes knocking on our door, we say, no, get out, go back to the fields, work some more. You're not coming in here. I'm not going to serve you food. I'm not going to sit down and eat with you. No, I'm not going to listen to you. No, get out, go back to the fields, work some more. That's how you treat your servant, your flesh, your old nature when he comes knocking at your door. Our flesh will then back off. Yes, because it is under our authority. And then we immediately, we leave that pornographic website. In that way, we escape from temptation. So every time our flesh tries to tempt us to sin, we must rebuke it and resist it in the name of Jesus. Exactly as we would fight off a deadly home invader. Exactly. It is dangerous. It's deadly. Romans 8, 13, Jesus, uh, Paul says, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. Yes, if you allow your flesh to have authority over you so that you end up obeying your flesh, your sinful nature, your servant, you will die. That is the consequence. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And we have Jesus living in us through the Holy Spirit. We have authority over our flesh. We can put the misdeeds of our flesh to death and we will live. There are, of course, other ways besides unforgiveness and fantasy lust by which our sinful nature can tempt us to sin. Yes, there are other sins. For example, the temptation to anger, to hate, to greed, to covetousness, to fornication, to adultery, to pride, to jealousy, etc., etc. 
etc. I believe each believer has an area where they are potentially weak, where they can be potentially, yes, tempted to sin. I believe every believer has such a weakness in their life. But by the Spirit, you can put your flesh to death. You have been given authority over that weakness of your flesh. Whatever our flesh says to us, we must immediately exercise authority over it with mountain moving faith, with all harshness, with no doubt, no wavering, no hesitation. And like a servant, our flesh will obey us and we will escape from temptation. So I know according to the Lord's prayer, we do say, Lord, lead us not into temptation. And of course, we should pray that, Lord, lead me not into temptation. But when the temptation comes in the form of your old nature, your flesh, what do you do? You rebuke it. You say, no, no, no. Go back to the fields, work some more. Now, there are three things under our authority as followers of Jesus Christ. Number one, disease. Number two, demons, especially when we are preaching the gospel. We have authority over disease and demons. And number three, our flesh, our old nature. All three are under our authority. Which one of the three is most deadly to us as believers? Disease, demons, or our flesh? The answer is number three. Our flesh, our old nature, is most deadly to us as born-again believers. So remember when your flesh, your servant, tempts you to sin, remember, that can be deadly. So rebuke it with authority and mountain-moving faith. Go, leave in Jesus' name. So we do not allow our dog or our flesh to rule over us. They are our servants. You do not allow your dog to rule over you in the same way you do not allow your flesh to rule over you. Now, can you imagine following every whim of your pet dog? Imagine you're taking your dog out for a walk on a leash, okay? And suddenly, on the other side of the street, your dog sees a cat, all right? And at that moment, there are cars whizzing by on that street. And your dog begins to pull you toward the street so that your dog can chase after that cat on the other side of the street. What do you do? Do you obey your dog? Do you follow your dog? Do you allow your dog to pull you into that street with the cars driving by? Of course not. What do you do? You hold on to the leash. You restrain your dog. You restrain your dog. You do not allow your dog to pull you into the traffic. That is authority. That is how you treat your old nature, your flesh. You restrain it. It's under your authority. Titus 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. By God's grace, we disciples can Quote, aim for perfection, unquote. According to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, we can aim for perfection. We can begin to obey Jesus' command to be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 17, verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we drive out the demon? Verse 20, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain or to our flesh, 
if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, that is to your flesh, move from here to there, and it will move. Your flesh will obey, and nothing will be impossible for you. Therefore, living a holy life, being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, will not be impossible for you. If you have mountain-moving faith, nothing will be impossible for you. And when your servant, your flesh, tempts you to sin, you rebuke it with mountain-moving faith with faith as a mustard seed, and it will not be impossible for you to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Mark eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, whatever that mountain is in your life, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen. It will be done for them. And then we skip one verse to verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Once again, if we want to move a mountain in our lives into the sea, if there is some mountain in our lives that we don't want, that we want to move into the sea, we must first forgive others. That's the precondition. First, you forgive others. Then you can move that mountain into the sea. We must first move the mountain of unforgiveness in our heart toward those who have hurt us. In many of us, there is a mountain in our hearts. It's a mountain of unforgiveness and bitterness toward those who have hurt us in the past. We have to move that mountain of unforgiveness into the sea by forgiving those people. Paul declared, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27, No, I strike a blow to my body. That is, my flesh. I make it my slave, said Paul. That is, I make it my servant, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Closing this Luke 17 teaching to his disciples on how to treat servants, Jesus said the following, Luke 17, verse 10. So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We disciples, as unworthy servants, we must obey his commands without hesitation. We don't tell Jesus what to do. Jesus tells us what to do. And as servants, we obey him at once. That's our duty. That's simply our duty as servants of Jesus. So, there is no need to get proud when we obey the Lord. There is no need to think that now you are, quote, somebody in the church because the Lord is now using you with powerful signs and wonders and you become famous in the body of Christ with many invitations for you to minister. No, there's no reason to get proud. No, no, no. You should consider yourself, quote, an unworthy servant. Instead, instead of getting proud, what does Jesus command us to do? He commands us to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5, verse 48. At one Saturday class in the past, last year, 
I felt led to minister mass healing after the teaching. At that time, there was a dear sister present who had been quite oppressed by unclean spirits. The next day, I received an email from this sister, and she wrote me, after you commanded healings at last night's Radical Disciples meeting, I felt like a torchlight, as though someone had lit me from within, lit me up from within. My eyes were clearer, and the pain at the back of my neck and head vanished. I thank and praise God Almighty for his presence. But who am I? I'm talking about me now. William, who am I? I am only an unworthy servant. I have only done my duty before the Lord, which is, well, the Lord has entrusted his supernatural authority to me, to us. And he commands us to heal the sick and cast out demons. I was just doing my duty before the Lord. He commands us to make disciples of all nations. And then we do that. We are simply doing our duty before the Lord. When God uses us supernaturally to heal the sick, cast out demons, and bring many souls to the Lord, you know what? We are just unworthy servants. Me, I'm referring to myself. I am just an unworthy servant doing what the Lord told me to do. That's it for today. So I thank you, dear brothers and sisters, for joining me today for this teaching for radical disciples. Jesus teaches us to say no to our flesh. Now, um, I do not have time to go through more of our missionary adventures. So I'm going to save it for next week. So please join us again next week. Okay, now, if you'd like to have the video playlist of this session and the accompanying PowerPoint presentation of this session, email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Okay, next Saturday, July 2nd, we're going to study startling revelations from the parables of Jesus, which you might never have heard. So join us again in one week for the startling revelations from the parables of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, thank you for joining us. I hope you will stay back for much more for fellowship, for healing ministry with Brother Teddy. Praise the Lord.